Thank you. Uh, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, embed Linux, which I, I get the feeling is a, uh, a non-common topic uh, inside inside Bristech, uh, but hopefully it will be interesting to some of you, and maybe there'll be some. Uh, we good? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, hopefully it will uh, be in the right sort of place when you run into these problems uh, in the in the future. Uh, I guess I'll start off by asking uh, who here like owns a Raspberry Pi, uh, and keep your hand up if you've managed to m like make it boot or do anything at all with it. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and keep your hand up if you've installed any operating system that isn't the, the um, out of the box experience, the Raspberry and OS. Oh, okay, okay, good. That's more than I was expecting. Um, so I'm using Raspberry Pi here as. Um, as an example, there are other um, other embedded Linux platforms are available. We're in Bristol, so we should be using the 4K Open uh, thing from our from our friends here. Um, but what I'm going to say is broadly applicable to all of these platforms, and at this level, they're approximately the same. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about sort of IoT type devices. Uh, I think they were called IoT last year. I believe this year they're now Edge devices. Um, but they're the same thing, they're a small box and it runs Linux and people don't consider it to be a computer. Um, and if you're building one of these, then Linux is a really good platform to use it. It has drivers for literally every single thing that you can possibly imagine has already been written by somebody. It's a proper operating system, it's nicely written, the price is right. Um, it's a really, as long as your device costs more than about 50 quid, then um, then you can afford to run a processor which is big enough to run Linux and therefore and you probably should be running Linux on those devices. And moreover than that, uh, it's actually an amazingly good environment for building prototypes on because you can sit in front of this device, um, you can run GCC on it, you can run your favorite debugger on it. If you want to copy files in or off it, you just use SSH and STP. Um, if it's a Raspberry Pi, you can plug an HDMI cable in it and just run a full desktop Linux environment do all your development on there, and when you finish, unplug the monitor, stick it into a shoebox, and um, there's your prototype ready for ready to show to people. Now, that's great, but um, and prototypes are great, right? But in order to get value out of code that you've written, it fundamentally has to be um, in people's hands, right? And that means going from a prototype to uh, to distribution, to production, to getting that thing out there into you know, more than one or two people sat around a table um, to make it go. And, and then we start having questions like, okay, we can SSH files to these devices. Well, sure, but you're gonna SSH files to like hundreds of devices on a production line. You're gonna have some guy sat there, plug in the device, wait for it to DHCP, connect over the serial port, ifconfig, I'm an old school guy, uh, find out the um, uh, the IP address it's got, SSH the files in, you know, copy the uh, copy the systemd scripts to, to make the thing boot. Uh, you're not gonna run GCC on the device, same thing. And so now we're kind of in a sort of a slightly different world where all of these nice advantages, very, very easy environment, starts to run into the hard realities of we want to be able to produce these devices in a sort of series fashion. Um, and this is kind of what I want to talk about today is that bit, like how do you make more than one of these devices, more than two of these devices for it's a prototype. And um, I'm so I'm guilty of doing a bunch of these. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I will hold up my hand and say I have actually charged people for things that involved uh, running a dbootstrap and a bunch of scripts to set up um, to set up an embedded Linux device. Um, that was a long time ago. And what, what people commonly do, um, what I did, what lots of people I speak to are already doing and would really are starting to realize that they're not quite going down the right path uh, is to say, well, you know, We'll just use X, and X can be whatever your favorite system administration tool of the day is. Um, apt is a very, uh, apt is very popular. 
um, or maybe you'll use RP RPM, or maybe we use Ansible, because that's a thing, or Docker, uh, or maybe Kubernetes. I've actually seen articles on Hacker News suggesting that you could use Kubernetes to deploy uh, software to like hundreds of devices in the field. Um, good luck to them is all I can say. Um, the and I guess the, the thing to take home here is that familiar desktop tools um, are very convenient, very handy hammers. And I kind of want to explain why they don't work and why that's probably not the, the right path to go down and a bit about what's what the alternative is. Uh, so I know I said at the start, sort of APT, apt is a great solution. And that's sort of the, the number one answer to how do we solve installing software problems is like, okay, we'll just use apt. And so I'll ask a question, like what does this do? Apt install vim. So I'm living in this century, I didn't say apt get install. So it's, go on. It installs vim. Okay, and it does, it definitely does install vim. Um, assume you've got network connection. Uh, it installs vim, but what does it actually install? And you see, it turns out it actually depends on what particular time of the day you ran that command on. Uh, this is uh, uh, an extract of the, of the changelog for Vim on Debian Stable on, uh, on my system um, uh, recently. And so, you know, at some point over the weekend, uh, the maintainer uh, uploaded a new version uh, on here uh, and on here. And so, The system's working just fine on Friday the 29th of September. You go away for a weekend and you come back on Monday the 2nd of November and all of a sudden your production line installation is actually going to install completely different software on your system. And, and this is like really bad, okay? So um, sort of a standard piece of software procedure is the idea of um, reproducible builds. You really want to be able to say, okay, I want to go back to the thing that worked last week. Like, make me build that thing again, please. Um, and then you can do git bisect in order to solve the problem and find out what the actual, why actually caused your problem. Um, and that's a nice thing to have. Some people can do it. Some build systems don't quite do it. Um, but th this thing is way worse, right? Um, because overnight, like your production line can just change. And um, if you're lucky, then someone on the production line notices that your devices are no longer working and they pull the cord and the production line stops and uh, some poor person, uh, it might well be you, uh, gets the next flight out to China and goes and figures out why the thing isn't working properly and, and goes and fixes it, right? And, uh, and that's, that's like a long haul last minute flight, but that's probably the best option. That's the best outcome. Um, like bad outcomes are things like, uh, the boxes just get packed up, stuck in a box, stuck in a bigger box, stuck on a ship. They spend three months uh, floating um, uh, around the world. And then the first thing you find out that a whole bunch of these devices don't work is when your customers start um, phoning you up and saying, eh, I've unboxed it, it don't work. Um, and now you have like, okay, we're gonna recall these devices, but we don't know which serial numbers have the Duff version of Vim on because it's just the ones that happen to run in some arbitrary windows. This is, this is a really, really bad thing. And um, like this is a problem, right? If you're a reasonably good hacker, then you can come up with solutions that, that fix this particular problem. Um, but it's kind of, it's going down a rabbit hole of, of, of adding more complexity. So you can, you can do that work around, it'll, it'll kind of work, but then you, okay, we need GPL compliance, um, so it turns out you need caveats. I'm not a GPL licensing lawyer. This is just how I understand things work. Um, there was a website run by a bunch of guys who do GPL enforcement, and they are funded by collecting money from the people who they enforce GPL against. And they have a website that explains what you have to do. And one of the things they say is you have to be able to provide all of the source for all of the code for your devices for the specific version for years into the future. And so just saying, hey, um, you've got Vim on there. I think Vim's GPL'd. Um, uh, go fetch the source code off GitHub is, is absolutely not enough. Um, 
you're the one distributing the software, you're the one distributing the binaries, you also have to distribute exactly the version of source code which is on the device that the customer has. Um, it's a pain. Um, soluble, but a pain. Um, other things, you want cross-compilation, like it's nice to be able to build things on, on the Raspberry Pi when you're developing, um, but soon you're going to want a continuous integration system, and you probably don't want to run your continuous integration system on a fleet of Raspberry Pis. You want to be able to run those um, on, on real computers, on real servers. Um, you want to optimize probably specifically for the particular processor. Um, your processor vendor spent a lot of money buying fancy features from ARM, and it would be a shame to not use them just because um, the particular um, embedded Linux you're, you're building is targeting um, a very baseline system. So I, my laptop, I mean, it's a shame. I have my fancy AVX, whatever it is, um, but Debian doesn't support it, so none of the software is compiled with AVX turned on. Um, and you need software updates, and no, APK doesn't work. Um, if you have software update questions, then come talk to me afterwards. Uh, I only have half an hour of this talk, and I would love to talk to software updates at length to anyone who cares, <laughs> but we can't do it now. Um, um, and then you probably also want control over library versions, right? So um, the maintainers of distributions are always walking a very fine line between um, stability and bug freedom of their libraries, uh, which requires them to run old versions, and having fancy new features in the hands of their users, which requires running the latest versions of their software. And in a whole, they make a pretty good, pretty good job of this stuff, um, but beware that their goals are probably going to differ from your goals about what you want. So if you find a thing and you need the latest fix in some latest version of a library, maybe you find a bug, you fix it. Um, perhaps the Raspberry and maintainers don't consider this fix critical and won't push it out on quite the same schedule that you would like to push it out to your users. Um, and so you really want to be able to control the versions of all these things. So when you find a bug upstream, you can just fix it and push it out on your without requiring uh, negotiation with the maintainers. Um, so that's the problem. Um, Solution-wise, I think you want something a bit like this. This is the top diagram on the on the blue at the top here. So. What we'd really like is a description of what we want the system to be. Right, and we're going to keep this thing in source control so we can code review it, so we can go back to old versions when it doesn't work. And then we want to have a compiler. Um, and the compiler is a completely stateless thing. It just takes a whole bunch of stuff here and does a bunch of compilation and spits out um, a thing here. And the thing here wants to be exactly the artifact which you go and take to production. No oh, Bob just runs a post-processing script, or we do these formal steps that somebody knows. No, no. Artifact for production comes straight out the compiler. That's, that's kind of what you want, right? Um, because now all of the tools we use for keeping software working, version control, code reviews, being careful about things, being able to review changes, um, both before and after they break everything, uh, are now back in our control again, right? So you want this. And this is... Um, this is the same thing as like DevOps do with this concept as configuration as code, right? You, rather than just have a system administrator install bits of software on your servers, you write down your, con your system configuration and then you have a, uh, a straight process that just takes that configuration and blasts it, onto your, blasts it onto your environment. And that's what Kubernetes is doing, that's what Ansible is doing, things like that. Um, and this is also like exactly what Make was, right? You know, it's only... Uh, 30 plus years ago, but basically the same principle. You have a bunch of source code, you have a single command and it spits out your executable that you want to write. <coughs> and <coughs> the reason why the reason why this isn't what sort of desktop Linux does is that this is fundamentally different to the way you, you work with a desktop operating system, right? With a desktop operating system, the model is I mutate my laptop to work with what I want, my problems I have today. If I wake up in the morning and decide I don't like Vim anymore and I really want to use Emacs, I type apt-get install Emacs, and now I have an Emacs environment. And if I decide I don't like Emacs anymore, um, app remove, and it's done again. Um, and so the contents of my laptop is basically a little special snowflake. And that's cool. Like, I'm happy with my laptop being a special snowflake. Um, but just beware that things built for this model, the laptop model, are, are not the things you want to do to build 
a little product summary. Um, so, it turns out, unsurprisingly, that there is a reasonably well-known in the right circle solution to this problem. And the solution is called um, Yocto or Open Embedded. Um, and it's, it's industry backed. Um, there's a bunch of sort of independent people on it. There's a bunch of really big companies. Intel are heavily involved. Texas Instruments are heavily involved. It's been used by lots of big companies. Um, I know companies like Facebook build bits of their server infrastructure um, using it. Um, I think if you buy um, sort of like NAS servers from Dell, I mean, you buy a NAS, what it is is just an Intel PC with a bunch of hard disk stuff inside it. Um, they all use this thing to build the stuff that, the stuff that they do. Um, and it supports uh, sort of hundreds of different boards. So almost any piece of embedded Linux hardware which you can buy today in quantity um, comes with support. Someone somewhere has already made it go with Yocto, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and it comes with zillions of software packages, not quite the same level as sort of desktop Debian, um, but still almost anything you can think of um, is available in there. Um, whether it's called Yocto or Open Embedded is, uh, is a tricky question. Um, uh, I will try and use both to keep both camps happy. Um, so I remember back in the olden days, actually people here, J Joel Spolsky, is he, yeah, yeah, he's still, he's still a thing, right? Is he a thing? I don't know. Okay. So back, and I looked up, back in 2000, the year 2000, uh, Joel Spolsky wrote this, the Spolsky test, which was basically a description of um, what a sane software development practice looks like. And uh, question uh, number two uh, on his list was, can you make a build in one step? Um, and it, it's actually quite surprising now, it's quite common that you still find software development practices that don't meet uh, step number two on a 18 to 20 year old uh, document. But in Yocto you can do this. Right? So you type bitbake my widget image and what that does is it, um, it will build an image. So it starts by saying, okay, we're gonna need a, we're gonna need a GCC cross compiler for whatever platform you're doing. So it, it bootstraps GCC, builds your GCC cross compiler. Um, then it builds GNIBC and then it builds Linux and Linux kernel, and then it builds all of user land um, and all of the libraries you need. Um, and then finally it builds your application. And it takes all of that, when it's finished building all that, and it takes all of those things and mashes them together and gives you at the end a disk image, which is the thing that you can then flash onto a device at the end. Right? And it does the whole process and it does it all from source. Um, and the thing that's really nice um, is that it has really quite sophisticated dependency tracking built in. So uh, at any point you can make a change. So if you go and change some kernel configuration or you change the version of some library somewhere in your dependency tree or you make a change to your own application, all you do, bit bake my widget image and it will rebuild just the components that are necessary, any downstream dependency of those, chugga chugga chugga, out pops a, a new uh, image of your system. Um, and remember a few slides ago, I was talking about this. Like this is the solution to this problem when your problem is embedded Linux. And this thing uh, is Yocto for open embedded and the command that you run is called bitbake. Um, and that's the disk image there. And so this is a, this is a really powerful thing and so this is what you want. Um, brief introduction to Yocto. Yocto is a relatively complicated piece of software. Um, it has a reasonably steep getting started learning curve, but I will try and implore that this is the right, the right way of solving these problems. And it, and it is complicated because there is quite a lot of stuff going on. Um, and it's very difficult to avoid a bunch of this complexity. Um, so I'll give a kind of next part talk, give a little brief introduction on some of the key abstractions to understand um, in the Octo. So there's sort of four key things that you need to kind of understand with the Octo, how, how it fits together. So the first one is a recipe. 
Now, a recipe is a bunch of instructions to build uh, a single piece of software. So there is a recipe behind Vim, and it will build Vim, and it knows how to do it. And you generally have one of these for every Git repository uh, in your organization or every um, library which you need um, externally. Um, and then that the output of that corresponds roughly to a Debian package. Right? They're, they're more or less the same thing. The next thing is an image. So an image is basically just a list of software to install on a device. A bunch of packages, any special commands you need to do to fiddle things like etc password. Um, you can bundle all that stuff together um, into an image. Now, you notice neither of those two talk about a hardware platform, right? So images can be run on any hardware platform. Recipes can be built on any against any platform. So exactly the same recipe to build Vim will build Vim for an Intel machine or build Vim for an ARM machine. They build without change. So the next thing that Yocto uh, has is an abstraction around a machine. And so this is talking about a specific piece of hardware. So in order to have um, Yocto work on your thing, you need a description of the machine. And so there is a machine called Raspberry Pi 3, which knows everything about what a Raspberry Pi 3 is. It's, it's a 64-bit ARM processor with these particular set of, um, uh, of options and a bunch of other things about how you, uh, how you build a, a car, um, how you build an image which can be flashed onto a, onto a Raspberry Pi. Um, and then, so that's a machine, right? And that exists independently of images or recipes. They're, they're completely orthogonal concepts. Okay, and then finally, um, there's a concept of a layer. Now, a layer is a collection of basically all of the above. Um, and this is a sort of the unit of sharing uh, inside the community. So you, you, you bundle all of your uh, information about how to build uh, a particular thing. So maybe it's your application or maybe it's a particular piece of hardware. So there's a layer for a Raspberry Pi um, together into a layer. And what's really powerful about Yocto is when you build a project with it, you do that by combining a bunch of these layers together. Um, so I'll give an example here. Um, so let's say we have, we have a widget, and my widget's going to have a screen. So um, Qt is a common C++ UI framework. So uh, all, meta, all layers uh, in Yocto stroke open embedded uh, start with META minus, and this is just a some historical naming convention that's just there, right? So anything meta something is a layer. Right? So we have MetaQt5, um, which is our UI framework. Um, some guys wrote some of this stuff in Python, and we're still using Python, so we have MetaPython that knows everything about what it means to run Python on a device, so it can build the Python compiler. Um, it knows how to install packages that use setup tools. So you can just say, hey, this thing over here, git repository, setup tools, go. And that's that will make everything that you need to work, work. Um, hardware platform, we're building a Raspberry Pi, Meta Raspberry Pi. Want software updates, Meta Updater, software updates done. Um, and the nice thing about this is um, when halfway through the project, someone's like, hey, this Raspberry Pi thing is no good. Um, we've decided we're going to use BeagleBone instead. Um, oh, no problem, because uh, you just go and fetch the layer from Texas Instruments, TI, Meta TI, which knows everything about um, building for BeagleBone, recompile, and you're done. Um, and this is actually really powerful, because for a lot of the development that I've done, I've tended to find that um, you're trying to build software, but it doesn't actually need to be running on the real software device. You've got, you've got enough abstractions in place where you don't really need a physical piece of hardware, you just need something which can run your software. And out of the box, it comes with support to run inside QEMU emulator. Um, and so we would often be sat there developing uh, just on a desktop machine, and then just run your tests, and it just pops up a, a KVM emulator in the background, runs a bunch of stuff, um, shuts it down. And that means you can just develop on your laptop without needing any development hardware. Uh, and the guarantee that Yocto gives you is that the same thing will build and the same thing will run basically exactly the same on your, on your real hardware platform. Um,
so that's that's kind of what Yocto is um, and what it does. Um, I guess I should drop. Normally at this point, um, I would sit down and do a, a live or um, something that looks close enough to live to the audience to be considered to be live demo of how this thing works. Um, but I won't, um, and I won't even in include tutorial instructions. Um, there are many, many examples all over the internet of how to make this stuff go. Um, search your favorite search engine or your favorite video streaming site to find them. Um, I'll give a few pieces of advice um, which are probably worth doing when you're doing this. Um, the thing you want to start with is called Pocky. Um, Pocky is what the Octo guys call a distribution. And a distribution is a bit different to a Debian distribution, um, but it's basically a bunch of decisions and a bunch of defaults that you want. And if you're getting started, the answer is to use Pocky. So I would implore that you do that. Um, and then the, at some point, it will be the time to move away from Pocky. Um, but that time is probably not now. Um, my second piece of advice would be uh, don't build this that would be to not build this thing on a tiny VM. Um, if you're using a MacBook, as it seems the entire world does these days, you can't just build Yocto. You need to be running on a Linux environment. Um, you can build this thing on a MacBook, but give the VM like most of the cores and a lot of RAM and a lot of disk. Um, it takes it's when I said it builds the entire of Linux from s from scratch to start. Um, it really does. It uses tens of gigabytes of, uh, of disk space and will chug away for a few hours f on the first build. Um, once the first build's done, you're kind of okay because um, the caching thing inside Bitbake takes over. And unless you make any crazy big changes, um, it won't have to rebuild the entire world. And so normally you can get a rebuild done in a few seconds on a reasonable machine. Um, but in the end, you're doing this sensibly, doing this seriously, you're probably going to want a machine with half a dozen or more cores to kind of make this happen. And um, finally, as for kind of getting started hardware, QMU is pretty good. You can just make this thing go on a laptop when you're sat on the train, no problems. Um, or if not, uh, if you're like me, you've got one of every Raspberry Pi that the Raspberry Pi Foundation have launched in the entire of the last 10 years. Uh, just use one of those. And Meta Raspberry Pi is pretty well supported. Um, and lots of people use them. And everything sort of just works. Uh, and they're cheap, so people don't have to spend money. Um, so I guess that's sort of my uh, my talk. We've got about um, 15 minutes for questions. Um, yeah, so my kind of, my starting point is that the things that work for prototyping don't work for production. Um, and the thing you want to do to build embedded devices um, for sort of production type use cases uh, is probably uh, it's probably Yocto and Open Embedded. There are some other ones um, that are broadly similar in capabilities. Builder is an example if you're um, if you want to do things that not everybody does. Um, and the model here is to build uh, the entire OS image from source. And you can see there's a bit of a um, uh, a parallel here um, between what what I'm saying for this and the things that you see. Uh, sort of Google's build process where they have a mono repo that has everything in it and then you type one build command and it builds a binary image on your on your machine which is effectively derived from that source and you never have um, intermediate binary artifacts which are published to some server somewhere which you just fetch the latest one off like both of those both um, my understanding of the Google process and the Yocto processes don't do that. Like, the source code is the thing you start with, so use that as the as the input, and then use caching to speed up the build. Um, <coughs> and then um, the final thing is that these the concept of layers is what provides um, reusability of this between different projects. So once you, if you're doing this as part of a of a bigger corporate um, project then the things that you can, the intelligence, the smarts that you can build into these layers is something which you can push forward and use over lots of projects regardless of what hardware platform or exactly what uh, the rest of the software is uh, that you're making it from. Um, cool, so I think that's it. Um, I think we have somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes uh, for questions 
happy to talk. Yes, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, so the question was, what should you do for updates in the field? Um, so the basic answer for the update question is uh, logically, you ship an entirely new image. That's the, the logical behavior is we're currently running image version A. We're going to move to image version B. Um, and in practice, you don't want to ship entire images, and you can do that. Um, if your devices are connected via broadband internet, then it doesn't actually, then you're probably going to build an image which is maybe 20 or 30 megabytes in size, and so it'll fetch over broadband internet in a few seconds. Um, because um, the nature of um, embedded Linux builds is they're very, very small, because most of the stuff of embedded offerings of a full blown operating system isn't needed. So your images are actually very, very small. Um, OS tree um, is a solution which is um, basically think Git, but for managing file systems, not for managing um, uh, bunches, of bunches of source code. So it's Git plus the ability to um, handle full POSIX file system semantics and extended attributes and all of those things, um, but more or less the same model uh, where you can say, please, like when you do um, git pull, it only fetches changes down. OS3 has a similar model. Um, and it does some, um, some quite cool shenanigans with uh, hard links to mean that you don't have multiple copies of these binaries sat around in your file system. Um, it turns out uh, I'm the author of Meta Data, which does exactly this. Um, so it integrates this with Yocto, and you can take your Yocto design, and you can say, add software updates, and then you get software updates. And it does that without needing, effectively, to have two copies of the operating system on a single flash drive. So you're, you're hitting binaries there. Yes, binaries. Yep. So um, run a build, produce a new um, uh, a new file system image. So that's basically the everything comes down to a pinch point of a of a tarball, which is the entire file system image. And that tarball is based on a bunch of source code. And it's what we would normally do is we'd write down the exact version numbers of all of the source code that goes in it actually inside the file system image. And so, in fact, if you, it's really nice, right? So you, you go and find a device in the field and someone say it don't work. Um, you can go and stick a debug cable in it, dump out the, the list of git commits that went into the thing. Um, and in fact, the way we had it set up is you could just take those plop it onto your desktop machine and rebuild exactly the firmware which is on the device. Um, but then, so that's the pinch point, one file system image, and then you say, okay, how do we do Delta updates in order to send that out to the clients without using lots of network bandwidth? Yeah. Cool, sir? Um, so when you're loyal to like a large file or database, yes. is that what you use most? No. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is a bunch of support for doing this. Um, you can, um, you. So one way of doing one way of doing that is to say so you can you can ask Yocto to take a mirror of all of your source code. So you can say do a build and write out a bunch of mirror files so that I can do the next build off the internet, um, and then you can actually take that thing that computer off the internet and check it. Um, and then you're good. Uh, then you definitely have all of the source code. Um, what you'd really like is a command which is like bitbait minus C GPL compliance, and it would spit out like this uber tarball sorted by um, only the licenses that need source code, um, and then plot that somewhere with your build output. Um, as far as I'm aware, there isn't that command yet. People keep talking about things that are kind of a bit like it, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it wouldn't be wasn't long before somebody. I mean, the big companies probably have all this stuff already. They just haven't open sourced it yet. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it something pops out somewhere, but I don't have any inside information on how that how that works. Yeah, so then. Do you do 
How does Yocto fail? Um, that's a good, good question. Uh, okay, so the question was, um, I've been very Yocto positive and I should offer some actual genuine counterexamples of cases where it doesn't work. Um, the, the, okay, the number one and number two issues are kind of early issues and it turns out that people struggle to get Yocto builds to work. And um, I'm not quite sure why this is. Like it works fine on my machine and it works fine on everybody else who uses it all the time's machine. But um, my, my experience is lots of people uh, struggle to get the hello world to build the first time. And once, it kind of, once they've kind of sorted it out, it's fine. Like it just keeps going. Like every time I type it back on my machine, it works. Um, but for some reason, there's always some gremlins that maybe it breaks on the first run. Uh, so that's probably the that's probably the hardest thing. So the, there's a there's a bump there, um, which other technologies sort of don't have, and the the community's kind of been trying to solve that, um, but it's sort of really hard because no one really understands why beginners keep failing, because <laughs> it works for all the experts. It just does all the time. Um, so that's one problem. Uh, the other thing is the build times are quite long. Um, the initial build is expensive, very expensive. Um, and that's kind of fine if you're using a real computer. Um, if you're trying to do continuous, int continuous integration, uh, it starts to become a pain, right? Because um, my laptop costs you know, a bit over a grand and has like four cores and it's hyper-threaded with a bunch of RAM. A similar machine on Amazon costs about a grand a month. Um, and so, uh, you probably want a machine that's a bit more powerful. Um, lots of people don't. So when you try and take a, a Yocto open embedded build and run it inside your corporation's existing CI environment, you tend to run into problems because you find that the CI environment is actually running on some tiny little thing, which is basically no more powerful than a Raspberry Pi. Um, I genuinely, like, I know a lot of companies whose CI servers are less powerful than Raspberry Pi 3s. Um, and it also takes a lot of disk space, and that is another thing which um, CI servers, which are like, ha, spin up a Docker image, download all of the source code, build it, plop output, um, basically don't work. Um, and so there's a bunch of work there to, to get a sane CI system going, and you really want the caching to be working, um, and the caching is at odds with, um, the CI people would really like to build from scratch every time because then they know it's going to build the next time. Um, but you probably don't want to be downloading like 100 gigabytes of source code for every single build uh, every time someone checks anything into your to any of your repositories. Uh, so there's basically just conflict there. Um, so that's... And that's, that's soluble, um, but it's not free. Um, and so... I routinely find that existing companies' CI infrastructure isn't isn't set up in a way that works for this sort of stuff. Um, good question. Um, you can tell us in soft what to build with. Uh, yes. Um, so the question was compare and contrast to build root. Um, so at a high level, um, build root is very similar. Um, you have a bunch of source code, you type build, build root uses make, um, and it spits out a file system image at the end of it. Um, so in terms of my like three, s like three boxes diagram, it's basically the same. Um, build root sort of takes a bunch of different engineering decisions along the way to get there. Um, so the biggest one that they did was they said, we're not going to solve the dependency problem properly. Um, and in saying that, they save a whole bunch of complexity out of their build system. They say, just rebuild it. When, it, when you're not sure about build dependencies, blow away a temp directory, you still keep the source code, that's fine, and then rebuild everything as a single process. Um, that simplifies the build root system enormously. So the actual 
the volume of source code in Buildroot is probably more than an order of magnitude lower than, um, than Yocto and Open Embedded. Um, for very small images, it doesn't really matter because you can build it very quickly. Once you start having big images with things like um, the Qt framework in, then you're starting to pay the cost and root of that rebuild process. Um, there's sort of a size of community difference as well. Um, Yocto's layer model, where you have independent layers that can just be composed together, um, is different to Buildroot's model, where Buildroot try and keep everything into a single repository, and they just maintain that as a thing. Um, and so there's a bunch of hardware platforms in there. Um, there's a bunch of recipes in there. You can add your own, but I think you can only add like one extra. At least it was that was the case last time I looked. Um, and so that's good in some ways. Like there's one set of quality control, one set of standards. Um, they build uh, Buildroot, by the way, uses Make as kind of the build infrastructure. Um, uh, Open Embedded uses their own thing based on some kind of sort of it's almost but not quite Python with a bunch of extra bits kind of pegged around it. Um, but Buildroot's like a sort of you know, ballet shoe. If it fits your problem and you don't need too much of the stuff that it doesn't do, then it's really great. It's small, it's lightweight, it builds fast, uh, it's easy, to, it's small enough to understand. Um, and Yocto is more like a um, industrial grade behemoth that can roll over any problem um, because it's been faced with more or less every problem but it pays for it by being a bit more complicated, both to use and to run and to maintain. Okay, I think that's time. So yeah, thank you very much for your, um, uh, oh, well, that's a bit, um, my slide run, oh, I've lost my slide, okay. Cool, yeah, thank you very much, John Fullways. I'll send the slide round uh, afterwards and there's some links to my contact details in there. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna meet up for coffee, um, have a chat over lunch. I'm, I live in Bristol, so you're welcome to talk to anybody. Cool, thank you.